brief 10-minute break, you'll probably see it in 45 seconds. If you haven't even turned it on, look at it, keep playing it, just check to make sure that it is off. Again, out of respect for the contestants and the audience members, we want to make sure that they have our utmost attention. We will now begin the humorous speech contest. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant in arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, we ask that you please not leave the room until it is determined that all the ballots have been collected. I will now commence and I will share with you the speaking order of the humorous speech content. Contestant number one, Brian Hamilton. Brian Hamilton, contestant number one. Contestant number two, Amy Lee Sigami. Amy Lee Sigami, contestant number two. Contestant number three, Nikita Abram. Nikita Abram, contestant number three. Contestant number four, Hong Ming Liu. Hong Ming Liu, contestant number four. Contestant number five. Amy Noel. Amy Noel. Contestant number five. Contestant number six. Steve Mustang. Steve Mustang. Contestant number six. And finally, contestant number seven. Marcus Carter. Marcus Carter, contestant number seven. We will now begin with the humorous speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please begin and signal me after one minute has commenced. You may begin. Contestant number one, Brian Hamilton. Trying to learn Spanish? Ay, Dios míos. <laughs> Trying to learn Spanish? Ay, Dios míos. Brian Hamilton. Dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. For a while now, I've been trying to learn Spanish. I think the culture is amazing, and the sound and the rhythm of the language is just beautiful. But I also learned that if you're not careful, you might embarrass yourself by using the words the wrong way. And your friends won't be there to help you, but more than likely they'll be there to laugh at you. <laughs> now, for beginners, you're going to make mistakes. Mistakes is inevitable. But mistakes happen, whether it's pronouncing a word the wrong way, putting the accent on the wrong word. Mistakes happen. But 
for some reason, my mistake seems to be worse than others. Uh, would you like to hear an example of it? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, there was one time, me and a friend of mine, we decided we wanted to get something to eat. So he decides he wants to go to a Mexican restaurant. I was like, yeah, okay, I can do that. But I just wanted something simple. Nothing too complicated, I just wanted something simple. Bacon and eggs, that's all I wanted. So we're up there at the restaurant, the waiter comes up to us, and then my friend, he starts speaking to the waiter in Spanish. And he speaks perfectly, the waiter understands him completely. Then my friend looks at me and I can tell he wants to uh, take my order for me. But I decide, I'm gonna try to impress him. <laughs> Get a little bit of knowledge and experience while I'm at it. So, waiter looks at me and I say, mmm, Dennis Webbles? Now, Webbles means eggs. So, I figured, Dennis Webbles means, do you have any eggs? Apparently, Webbles has more than one meaning. <laughs> <laughs> so, Webbles, in the sentence that I used it, could mean a certain area of a guy. <laughs> so, it was almost like I was challenging him, asking him if he has any courage. <laughs> and when I said this, my friend, he's out laughing. Like, he's done. So, I repeat the question, be in his webbles or no be in his webbles? <laughs> the guy looks at me, and I guess he can tell what I was saying. He looked at me and he says, I'm not scared of anything. Oh. <laughs> As you can imagine, I was very confused. <laughs> Eventually, they all explained to me that when you want to order eggs, you say, I Wells. That's how you said, is there any eggs? I Wells. So, eventually, I got my eggs, and I was very happy after they stopped laughing at me. <laughs> Luckily, I was in a restaurant saying that. And I'm pretty sure the, uh, the waiter has had that happen to him before. I'm not the first person to say that. But, unfortunately, my mistakes aren't just made in a restaurant either. Uh, another example. I was dating this girl. Uh, her name was Maria. She invited me to meet her parents. So I was pretty nervous, of course. Um, I, I agreed to it, of course, and when I got to the door, I'm sweating, I'm shaking, and she's just trying to calm me and relax me, saying everything's gonna be okay. I'm like, all right, all right. So her parents answered the door. First the father, I see the father, I shake his hand, I say, nice to meet you. Then I hug the mother. And the mother, when I hug the mother, she said, I esta sonado mucho, which means you're sweating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I respond, si, estoy muy caliente. <laughs> now I thought caliente means hot. You know, caliente actually does mean hot. But not in the senses that I use. <laughs> So I hugged the mother, and the first thing that she heard out my mouth in translation was, I am very horny. <laughs> she's laughing. She's, she's laughing. The father, not so much. <laughs> so I look at my girlfriend, and she looks kind of embarrassed. So I say, ¿Qué pasa? Esta embarazada. Esta embarazada. Zada. <laughs> Which I thought meant, uh, what's wrong? Are you embarrassed? Apparently I messed that up too. <laughs> After he, telling the mother that I was very hungry, horny, <laughs> I just told her that the uh, daughter was pregnant. <laughs> now at this point, the father is laughing too. <laughs> because he realized, I'm not a pervert, just me. <laughs> so, we start talking and I'm like, I see everybody's laughing at me and I understand that I made a mistake somewhere because everybody's just laughing at me right now and I'm just confused and sweating and nervous. <laughs> so I ask, which means, did I make a mistake? And then eventually everybody explained to me everything that I said. And I was like, okay. So the first words that came out of my mouth was, I'm horny, your daughter is pregnant, and it was a mistake. <laughs> We all calm down and everybody, you know, explain. I, we still laugh about that story to this day, but we're all good now. I, should, I tell this story to say, you know, mistakes are inevitable. As you can see, I made a lot while I'm trying to learn um, Spanish, but I refuse to give up. And I want to say the same thing to you. 
refuse to give up. Because mistakes, is, you're going to gain knowledge and experience. Now, I've been trying to practice this closing a lot because I don't want to make a mistake while I'm saying it. So, hasta luego y gracias. <laughs>
So I'm like, okay, mom. So I'm saying to myself, she's just mad. Cause <laughs> I'm moving up in this company and I might have her job. <laughs> From that point on, I said, okay, I'm gonna show her that I'm really worthy to work here and I can do this. So a couple of months go back, I see an office position open and I go apply for the position. Of course, I went to school for human resources so I know a little bit of this and I know a little bit of that. Apply for the job, get the job. My mother again. She doesn't know anything. She's walking past the office. She, she like, wait a minute. <laughs> what are you doing? Nikita did not tell you that this, you only here for one reason and one reason only. So I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm trying to show you that I can do this. I don't care. You only here for one reason and one reason only. I'm like, okay, whatever. She still don't know what she's talking about because I'm going to move up in this company and she's going to be really working for me because this is my mindset. <laughs> Now, when I get this position, I was driving my own car. So by this time, she already knows something. Now I'm riding to work with her. So she in the car, she like, Nikita, you know your anniversary day is coming up. You're going to have to go ahead and put your two weeks in. Again, I'm saying to myself, this lady don't even know. I'm staying at the job. I like this job. So my anniversary day come up. She kept telling me, you have to put in your two weeks. I'm like, whatever. Two, five. Anniversary day come up, July 18th. I walk in the job with her, I see balloons, I see cake, I see tables set up. And I'm like, who having a party? So people start running up to me, Nikita, why didn't you tell us that you were leaving? Why didn't you tell us that you were leaving? Why didn't you tell us that you put your two weeks in? And my mother's standing on the side of me and I'm saying to myself, I don't even know. <laughs> and my mother looking at me like, you better not say nothing. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't you? So I'm going along with it and everybody just questioning me. So Nikita, where you going to go? after you leave here, where are you going? I'm saying, I don't even know. <laughs> she didn't tell me nothing, so now I'm just like lingering. I don't know where I'm going. But I'm putting on this happy face like, girl, I'll probably be going to uh, Kennedy King or Harold Washington. I ain't applied for nothing. So after this, we, we leave and we get in the car and we on our way home. My mother was like, I don't know why you thought I was playing with you because I told you, you was not going to be working. Now, I am not going to hinder you from moving on your life. This is not a place that I wanted you to work. So I'm sitting in the car, saying to myself, I can't wait till I get to this house because I'm telling my daddy what you did to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we family get home. I'm, storm, I'm storming in the house. My daddy looking like, what, what's going on? What happened between you and her? She was like, I told you I was going to fight her. I don't know why she thought I was playing. So my, my father like, now nah, you ain't why would you do something like that to her? <laughs> so he come, he was like, baby, it's okay. He was like, you can come work with me. I'll give you two years. <laughs> you would not give me two years of nothing up to me. Like, yeah, man, congratulations. You know, today's your last day. And I'm saying to myself, I, she, I, this is, we ain't even getting paid today. Mm -hmm. My mother say, I'll mail you your paycheck. They got to go. <laughs> but the moral of my story is, I did, my son now is a freshman at NIU, and I did raise my son. I did go to school after that. Unfortunately, I didn't finish, but I understood what my mother was saying when she was trying to put me on the right track to, to do better. So thank you. Honors, may I please have one minute on the clock so that our judges may complete their nods.
Contestant number four, Hong Ming Liu. What's your limit? What's your limit, Hong Ming Liu? Harold Washington Library? Yes. I see a lot of nodding. I love that place. But the only problem is, I tend to get lost in that building. You see, although I'm Oriental, I can be very disoriented. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster and guests, I'm glad to tell you I solved that problem. You see, they have different quotes on different floors. <clears throat> By knowing the position of those poles, I can figure out my position. For example, on the first floor, the popular book session, they have this quote from Rancho Max. It says, outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. <laughs> Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> <laughs> but the quote I really want to talk about today is the one on the third floor right above the checkout counter. It's from Oprah Winfrey. He says, getting my library card was like citizenship. It was my American citizenship. <coughs> really? <laughs> As someone who waited in line for more than 10 years <laughs> to get the eligibility to apply for American citizenship, I find the comparison this proportion. <laughs> Every time I go by that quote, this is what goes through my mind. Kind of like a movie playing out. I at O'Hare Airport, going through the custom inspection. And then when the officer asks for my travel papers, timidly, I present my library card. <laughs> You've got to see the face of that officer. <laughs> he cannot believe his eyes. <laughs> what? Is this Chicago Public Library College? <laughs> you must be one of us. Welcome home. <laughs> Holding my card and struck down the hallway of course, Oprah is right. <laughs> this is my citizenship. <laughs> and suddenly, the silence all around me. I look back, the officer is chasing me and yelling, Stop him! Stop him! I just freeze, like a pin at the end of bowling lane. The officer is the giant bowling ball rolling towards me. You know what I mean? Bowling ball run. Like <laughs> I'm crashed. Down on the floor, he grabbed my car and he pushed right at my face. Look, look, you almost fooled me. Look, your car expired. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to ridicule Oprah. <laughs> I think it's a good example to show, even as empathetic as Oprah is, she has her limit. <laughs> I, to commiserate with any group, in this case immigrant, you need their perspective. And it's just impossible for Oprah to get everybody's perspective. So maybe where Oprah ends is simply where we start. And to me, this quote is a glimpse into Oprah's level. Other than that, I love this quote because library card excites me. I remember when I first got my Chicago Public Library card. It was the first week of my coming to America. I was 20-something kids, just come from China. I was so excited. I was counting the dates. Like somebody on the street at a bus station asked me, how long have you been here? I know the exact answer. Five days, 10 days, 20 days, all of a sudden, I realized the guy at the bus station is asking me how long I've been waiting for the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I told him 20 days. <laughs> no wonder he was surprised. <laughs> but that's an example of how much I can be wrapped up in my own perspective. That's my limit. 
It's so close I can touch it. And the good thing is once I recognize it, it gave me the opportunity to go beyond it and look around me in new eyes. French author Marcel Proust said, the adventure of life is not to look for new landscape. The adventure of life is to look at the old one with new eyes. It's true, isn't it? And the amazing thing is, when I look back, all the limits that used to obstruct, obstruct my view are not just milestones. They're the reminder of my progress in life. And I realize maybe a person's life can be better measured by these milestones than by years. And I have a confession to make today. In my milestone age, I'm like five. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this speech sounds like a kindergarten show and tell. <laughs> and it's exactly what you are getting. A sophomoric life lesson from a five-year-old. <laughs> Dear friends, with the sincerity of a five-year-old, I want to challenge each one of you to be on the lookout for your limit and use the encounter as an opportunity to elevate yourself above the limit and look around <coughs> your landscape of your life with new eyes. So I leave you with this final message. What's your limit, Mr. Toffman? Time is. Please give me one minute on the clock so that our judges can be good. Contestant number five, Amy Noel, Tales from the Diaper Pail. <laughs> Tales from the Diaper Pail, Amy Noel. from the pale. Proclamation number one. Always, always, always be prepared. <laughs> when Melissa Meyer took over Yahoo, she knew exactly what she was doing. She was Stanford educated. She was a Google alum. She was a mother-to-be at that time, and many thought she would have more poo on her face from Yahoo stock than she would from her three-week-old when she returned to work. But Marissa Meyer knew something. She knew 
that just as you stretch over to the left to grab the baby wipes as you go back to the right to keep your hand on them, because they move, do they move? <laughs> <laughs> and you're trying to keep this tenuous balance, and you're trying to make sure that you don't wind up with anything you don't want on your hands, yeah. that you would be in a far better position if you had your ducks in a row and your projects aligned and could move your process forward. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the first proclamation from the panel. Always be prepared. In addition to that, as I grew and as I learned and as I had a child getting bigger and stronger, I realized something that, you know, for starters, as they get bigger, so do the diapers. <laughs> so do the gifts in the diapers. <laughs> what I also learned was that children seize every opportunity. And I realized that for me as a professional, those are things that I needed to do as well. I needed to embrace that philosophy of seizing every opportunity. You know, a few years back, when Steve Jobs was just a full-headed, idealistic gentleman living on the West Coast, and he was working at IBM and slaving away, the powers to be at IBM knew that no one would ever want a small computer. <laughs> we'll just put that to the side for now. But Steve realized he was missing an opportunity. He realized that, in fact, like every single person in this room, we did, in fact, want small computers in our hands. We did, in fact, want the opportunity to control everything, essentially, in our universe right here from our palm. And I tell you, in pro um, proclamation from the pale number two. They know the same thing as well. My son will always seize the opportunity to need his pail as soon as I strap him into his car seat and he's all snug in. My daughter will without question seize every opportunity to say, Mommy, I'm poopy. Especially right if I put her in her bed <laughs> because she knows she might have a snack and a cuddle and maybe a little extension. But even beyond those two instances, more than anything, my children know to seize the opportunity that, not unlike the double name, in our house we have a thing called the double poo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's that they are aligned in their meal times or if the universe is aligned. But without question, as goes one, goes the other. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. Ladies and gentlemen, that is proclamation from the pale number two. Seize the opportunity. And try not to let the opportunity seize you at the same time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as I have the wonderful opportunity to see my little people turn into actual people expressing their personalities and showing me who they are, and they teach me lessons every day. But the most important lesson that they have really taught me, and the thing I'd like to leave you with today, is we know the cost of many things. I think I'd be a champion um, contestant on The Price of Life because I can tell you the per unit, per pack, 60 unit, 120 unit cost of any diaper. <laughs> I was a queen of the Pampers points. If you check my desk at cars.com right now, you will in fact see a Pampers reward sticker that is waiting for me to load it into my system so I can get it going. I knew the cost of this product. I knew down to the fraction of the cent as they are all priced. But I did not realize the value. I was not living like Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, who when he was boxing up books in his garage, he could clearly see the price right on the back was $9.99. But what Jeff understood that many of us did not was the value, the value of our time. The value of the opportunity to shop online, to read book covers, to do the exact things that we do in the bookstore, but in our jammies. And Jeff took advantage of that, knowing the value of our time, and knowing that we understood the cost of a book, and put those two pieces together and created one of the largest multinational corporations in the entire world. And in that same vein, I too learned a valuable lesson that I know will lead me to the top. I call this the Walgreens incident. A few
few weeks ago, I had a babysitter, whose name is also Amy, coming over for the evening. And little Amy, as we like to call her, needed diapers to change our youngest daughter, Alexandra, because as you all know, the minute she puts her in bed, she'll go, Miss Amy, I'm poopy. Now, I went to Walgreens, I was gonna grab the Pampers, and I said, you know, I just don't wanna whip out my bank card. I've got $7 cash. It's on the sitter anyway, and I'm paying her a pretty good penny to watch a house with sleeping children. She could take an extra poop if it's gonna run out. And I put that Walgreens diaper on my daughter, and I let her go to bed, and she woke up the next morning, her bed was dry, her pants were dry. Now what you all aren't aware is in addition to knowing the <coughs> proclamations from the pale, I knew about the proclamations from the Pampers, and that was they leak. <laughs> <laughs> I have one minute on the clock so that our judges can complete their balance. Contestant number six, Steve Mustaine, contest season. Contest Steve, contest season, Steve Mustaine. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, and all the rest of you who aren't able to leave this federally secured auditorium until I'm finished speaking. <laughs> and before I decided to compete in the humorous contest, I was wondering a few things. Out of all the members of my club, why were there so few contestants? Could it be that the more experienced Toastmasters knew something about competing that I didn't, but I should? <laughs> Or was it that I'm one of the few members that are suffering under the delusion of having an inner combat just waiting to burst out? Well, obviously I did decide to compete. And the reason I decided to compete was I found the quote that my daughter had taped to the back of her expired, oh, no, they changed back of her expired passport, which actually got me to a security time. <laughs> and the quote is by Mark Twain, and the quote is, A man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can in no other way. <laughs> <laughs> and after reading that, I, I knew that if I participated, I would learn many wonderful lessons. Lessons I would not be able to learn had I not participated. So tonight, I'm going to be sharing some of those lessons with you. Some of the lessons that I learned over contests. Learned by hard experiences. And I learned that contest season can be filled with anxiety, sleepless nights, and such total commitment and preoccupation to making speeches that I was catapulted <laughs> into altered states of consciousness. <laughs> and I learned that contest season can be stressful. Like 
Sometimes it can be stressful while you're giving a speech. <laughs> <laughs> So I told this story to a friend of mine, Harold, who's an experienced Toastmaster. And the story exemplifies the stress and total preoccupation that both of us had experienced the times during contest season. And the story begins with my wife calling to me from the living room. Now her voice sounds remarkably like mine. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I heard the refrigerator door open about five minutes ago, but I didn't hear it close. Did you forget to close it? Well, actually, I, I didn't. But I had lost track of time. See, as, as I was reaching into the refrigerator, I, well, actually, I couldn't even remember what I was looking for. I got so distracted, got so preoccupied. And, uh, what I was preoccupied with was making the speech. So. If you were to have seen me across the room, you would have seen me standing in front of the open refrigerator, dazing, just with a blank face at all the contents of the refrigerator. But if you would have seen me from within the universe of my mind, you would have seen that I was totally engaged, fully preoccupied, working at the beginning of my speech. And I'm thinking, uh, should I start off with a quote? If so, which one? Well, I like that one by Mark Twain. Or, I could start out the speech with a regular Toastmaster salutation. Mr. Toastmaster, and all the rest of you who are unable to leave this room until I'm done speaking. But wait a second. We're going to be in the Federal Reserve Bank building, Moscow Auditorium tonight. How about if I have the audience detained, detained by the feds? Yes. <laughs> Maybe detained by the Russians. That's even better. Excellent. Then my wife called and she distracted me. She said, Steve, did you forget to close the refrigerator door? <laughs> well, my mouth started off and I said, Dear, I'm working on the beginning of my speech. I think I've got it. It's going to be <laughs> regular Toastmaster screen at the top with the audience locked in the vault, and I'll be a delusional comic walking around carrying a cat by the tail. She said, Steve, what did you say about the kale? <laughs> and not wanting her to think that I was losing my mind or was lost in it, I lied. And I said, oh dear, the kale looks tasty as ever. <sighs> and then I said, oh, by the way, you're right. I did forget to close the refrigerator doors. Thanks for reminding me. Now, after I finished telling that story to Harold, Harold said, Steve, you know, if you change the speech, if you change the room, if you change the wife, that was my experience a number of times. <laughs> and Harold and I agreed that one of the best places to go roaming around, working on speeches, are the big box department stores like Walmart or Target, because there are literally acres of items that you can pretend to be looking at <laughs> while you're working on your speech. Contestant number seven, Marcus Carter. I've already won. <laughs> <laughs> I've already won. This is Marcus Carter. for coming out. <laughs> they did a wonderful job. You can tell they put a lot of work into this. So this is a momentous occasion. But so much so, I think I want to take a selfie with the Toastmaster. <laughs> <laughs> Toastmaster.
Toastmasters, distinguished guests, I would like to explain to you how I already won. Winning. Now, when we think of winning in Chicago, we think of Michael Jordan and the game winning shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or we think of the hero saving the day, reaching the highest of heights, overcoming adversity. Now, I haven't reached the highest of heights, but I have dealt with adversity. Now, don't worry about me. I'm okay, and I do feel like my best days are ahead of me. But if I were to look at life in terms of winning and losing, I definitely came to the game unprepared. And you can tell if you just watch me. I've had run-ins with the law. I've dealt with alcoholism. But probably my lowest moment was a Christmas when I wasn't able to buy Christmas presents for my two children. Skipping steps, expecting something for nothing, and appreciating the destination over the journey. And I wasn't, I wasn't winning. To overcome that, to go further, I had to get past my own self. Life wasn't in the way, I was in the way. I had this uncanny ability to skip steps, to buck the system, to want to do things completely backwards. Kind of like if we all signed up for Toastmasters, got our competent communicator manual, and skipped to speech number 10 instead of doing one, two, three, four. Now I'll give you an example of it. There was this one time I talked to God, I did, a man upstairs. And I knew it was him, and I'll never forget the day because I was listening to the radio, and it just felt like I heard a voice. And the heavens opened up, and it said, no money, no credit, no experience, and you can be a millionaire flipping real estate. And I said, yes, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. I, I, I called you, I texted you, I messaged you on Facebook, you didn't get back to me, but I knew, I knew you would come through. I mean, this is what I wanted. This was my chance to go from zero to 100 real quick, the opportunity I wanted to get in the game. I could skip some steps. I mean, at this point, I had exhausted all my financial resources, I had exhausted all my credit resources, and I had burned bridges with my family and friends from here to San Francisco. Now, let alone, the voice from upstairs said it was free. Which brings me to my second point. I expected something for nothing, and I still wasn't winning. Needless to say, the voice wasn't God, way too high pitched. <laughs> it was an actor, and he was telling us and inviting folks out to a seminar to learn more about Robert Kiyosaki, the writer of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Mecca Quadrillion Zillionaire, flipping real estate. And he was going to show us how we could get rich with no money, no credit, and no experience. Now, just having it come out of my mouth doesn't make any sense, but that'll give you an idea of where my mind was because I was there. I mean, I was there early, and I was walking differently. Before then, I kind of walked like this. But on the way there, I felt different. I was walking like this. I wasn't even saying hello. I just said, sup. <laughs> So I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for Rob to come out because we're first name basis now because Rob's going to help me be a millionaire. But <laughs> Rob couldn't make it because Rob was probably making sure that other people were going to be millionaires too. So he sent his right hand man there to make sure I was going to be a millionaire because they all wanted me to be a millionaire. And his friend that wanted me to be a millionaire explained to me that all I had to do if I wanted to be a millionaire was sign up for the three day training program that would make me a millionaire. Now usually this program that makes you a millionaire only costs about $1,000 but since they both wanted me to be a millionaire they would knock it down to $399 and that's all I had to pay to be a millionaire. Do you think I did it? I handed them my credit card, my social security, my birth certificate, everything. I was ready to go. Now, needless to say, my 10-year-old probably could have figured out what was going on there, but Marcus didn't. When I signed up for this program, they gave me this manual that was about this thick. 
Now, I kid you not, I got home and I read that whole thing in 45 minutes. 45 minutes. <laughs> but I was having a problem. I'm like, okay, I read it, but where's the chapter on the millionaire? That's <laughs> <laughs> I Is it an addendum to this thing? Like, I, I missed it. <laughs> but it was only then that it started to dawn on me that if you try to skip steps, you get nowhere. If you expect something for nothing, you don't get anything. And I still wasn't winning. But I was beginning to even the score. Because what I was learning with these experiences is that riches don't come from what's in here. Riches come from what's up here and what's up here, which gets me to my last and my final point. Being able to appreciate the journey versus the destination. Now I'll quote one of our great modern philosophers. Great man. Blake Burson. Basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> On one of his great philosophical platforms, Red Bull commercial. Gives you great. <laughs> and he said something on this commercial that will stick with me forever. He said, you can't fall in love with being great. You have to fall in love with the process of becoming great. Now, what that means to me is that you can't daydream, let alone daydream about get-rich-quick schemes. If wealth is what you seek, you would be better served surrounding yourself with wealthy people, learning about the hard work, the discipline, the habits that go into it. And I bet that you'll find that what they call wealth, what they call success, what they call winning has nothing to do with what's in their pocket and everything to do with what's in their heart. So as I start to funnel all of these experiences into speeches, I start to notice things. Speeches go from taking an hour to a day to maybe a week. But with this speech, I'm proud to say that this speech took me 33 years. So Toastmasters, distinguished guests, I've already won. Everyone, please remain silent for the judges to complete the ballots and for the ballots to be collected by the ballot counter.
contest here. Excuse me, contest master. We have all ballots. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, what an amazing contest, eh? Respect for the time and out of the fact that I want you to all go home and not be arrested, the federal building would like us to be a good suit. So, you thought I was all of a sudden being a homemaker and a busybody trying to make the place look nice. I'm not. I'm trying to set things up so we can facilitate the introduction of our evaluation contestants. And I do want to apologize to the evaluation contestants where to be interviewed before the intermission. That was an error on my part. So, if I may, for the sake of time, I'm going to call each of the contestants up and I will ask each evaluation contestant to line up in front of the guys as I do. First and foremost, let's begin with the evaluation contestants. Mr. Stephen Lindsay. The, humor, the humorous speech contestants up. As so I do, please line up the same way I had the evaluation contestants in order. Brian Hamilton. and we can be fast, can we not? <laughs> now, I know everyone is waiting, dying, just thinking on the inside to know who won, so let's not cause any more suspense. Let us call our Central South Division Governor, Oscar Langford, our Central North Division Governor, Rachel Mohammed, and our Lieutenant Governor of Marketing, Melissa Newport, to the front. Make sure 
that the ballots were counted quickly and that we will be able to get out. Because as everyone can see, it's a little bit later than 8 o'clock. Mm. Okay, it's a lot later than 8 o'clock. <laughs> so for right now, I'm going to have Melissa talk about, oh, we'll make announcements. That's what we'll do. Just so everybody knows, if you have not received the Central Station newsletter in your email box, there is a trainer trainer session that Joan Moore is doing on the 8th of October. The 8th of October during the day. And if you need any additional information about that, feel free to contact myself or Oscar Langford. It is a session that will be great for anyone who would like to start training during the officer training sessions. And we need as many trainers as we can get. So it would be really awesome if everybody signs up for it. So we can have more trainers. And if you sign up for it, make sure you contact us so that we'll know that you can be a trainer. All right, that's number one. Number two, Central North Division Contest is October the 9th. Woo! <laughs> it's going to be at the AT&T building, 225 West Randolph, 6 to 8 p.m. We're gonna work on making sure we uh, hit the time a lot better with yeah. that. It's a little challenging with seven humorous speeches and six evaluation speeches and a target speaker. But we will definitely uh, make sure that we get it a little faster than tonight. We'll work on that. So at this time, now that I've made these announcements, and we still don't see Oscar. He's coming. There's a contest coming this Sunday, too. Thank you. Sunday? So, October. Sunday. October. Mm -hmm. Saturday. That's a bit. Saturday. 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 Sunday. 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 It will be held on Sunday, October 5th at the Hinsdale Public Library. I'm glad you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and? On Saturday, October 11th, there will be a leadership summit in the North Division. Uh, everything from evaluation to thinking on your feet to everything in between will be taught at that time. And I'll hand it back over because I think there's a, I think the results have come in. Yes. to wrap this up real quick we're going to hand everything out really really fast the first person that we have something for is our lovely <coughs> dapper contest master
And we're second place winner in the evaluation speech contest, Kate Leinerson. And now, for the first place winner of the Central South Division Contest for Evaluation Speech, the delightful and dapper Dorsey. Thank you. 